discussion? <clears throat> all, right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Same side. <coughs> carries. Next, can I get a motion to approve the minutes of both the January 17th, 2018 regular board meeting and the February 7th, 2018 special board meeting? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed to the sign? <coughs> motion carries. Can I get a motion and a second to approve the bills payable? A motion. Second. Good, because that was a slightly uncomfortable pause. Um, <laughs> is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed to the sign? A motion to approve accepting the charitable donations for the second quarter of 2017-18. A motion and a second, please. Motion and a thank you. Second. And a thank you. And a thank you. It, it's, it's, it's always um, heartwarming to see the the range, both the both the range and the scale of the charitable donations. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed to the sign? Motion carries. Can I get a motion and a second to accept a quarterly review of student activities? Is that where I'm supposed to be? I'll make a motion. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign? Motion carries. With that, we'll move to the superintendent's report. Um, there's two things on, on my report that I'm reporting to you tonight. One's on special education resolutions as part of the agenda. And so, Deanna, um, MSDA has recommended that school boards approve two resolutions, one's towards uh, state aid funding for special ed, and the other is towards uh, federal funding for um, special ed. And Basically, back in 1975, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is take the resolutions and they're very wordy, whereas, 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 uh, and just so that you can go ahead and pass them without the reading. But both, basically, both resolutions that MSBA is asking to move forward, and of course they're going to present this uh, during the legislative session, is that in 1975, the federal courts promised to fund 40% of special education. Uh, and since that time, the, the federal government has never funded more than 15% of special education, which means um, that school districts uh, or their general fund pick up the rest of it. Uh, the cross subsidy for school districts uh, in the state of Minnesota is $679 million annually. Uh, and if you take that dollar amount and divide it amongst the students, they're saying that on average it costs $815 per student. Uh, to support special education. And that's just not the special education students. So if we get uh, $6,200 from the state of Minnesota um, for every child, 850 from every child is going uh, to help support special education. Um, Kim and I did do a check on ours if we were near that average or where we were at. So we took what we're funding divided by our number of students and we're right near that average, we're at about $822 per student. Uh, the resolutions aren't trying to <coughs> say by MSBA that school boards and school districts across the state of Minnesota don't see the need to support special education. Um, it's just trying to send a message to our legislators and then for them to put pressure on the federal level to, to help support it more than what they're doing. So. I think all of us in this, this room, all of us who teach, all of us who have a child, uh, we see the value in these programs and we want these programs around for our children um, and our grandchildren. So that's not what the resolution, that's not the intent of the resolution. Uh, once you as a board pass the resolution, then Indiana will <coughs> send it off to MSBA as the legislative session uh, gets going. I think up to this point, 152 school districts have, have passed the resolution that they're going to present during the legislative session. The, the next, any questions on that? They both tie into the very first two resolutions, and then I think that allows you to to, to waive the entire readings of both of the very long resolutions. Um, this ties into the five-year uh, projections. Uh, usually, I go around every year and I, I do the uh, five-year projections. I know the staff are very disappointed that I didn't do that this year. It's uh, very exciting and stimulating. 
and I think most in the room could probably uh, do it by now because they know that it ties to um, students, students, students that help drive it. But uh, I decided to share with this because in two weeks ago at our work session, um, it got brought up about we're looking at the AVID program again tonight prior to this, this meeting. You met with two high school teachers who talked about the AVID program. And one of the questions back to me from you as board members were, you said, you know, Tim, how do we make this decision on AVID? Because if we're going to have to hire AVID teachers and if we're going to have to have FTEs for that and if we're going to have to have some tutors, how can we make this decision when I don't know how that impacts the budget you know, long term, et cetera. And um, I can pick on you, Peter, but you know, you said to me, um, is there a 10 year plan for what the revenue is coming in, what the expenditures are, et cetera? And I said, there'd be no way I would ever be able to do a 10 year plan. It's tough enough to guess out um, four years on what is our student enrollment going to be, what is the state going to give us for legislatively. Um, and then in discussion with you, I discovered that as we've had new board members come come on here, that I never did go through the five-year financial projections with you. So I'm going to go through it very lightly tonight and how it ties into negotiating, how it ties into projections, and um, then from that, uh, at a work session coming up, you can ask me more detailed questions on well, what about this, Tim, et cetera. I will send you the 23-page attachment of how Kim and I put together those projections. I didn't want to send that to you electronically uh, before the meeting because I wanted you to just focus in on, on two of the pages. So in front of you, what I gave you, when you, when you do get that 23-page document, you will have on page number two all the assumptions that we walked through to get to that five-year projection. What I did up on the screen here is I've broken it into three sections. So if you're going to follow me on the screen, this whole page will be so that people in the audience could, could read it. Um, it breaks into the different projections and assumptions that we, that we do with it. Then on about page five and what I will be sending you, it goes into the um, five-year projections when you get one you can want to look at it. So, the first set of numbers then ties into what I call the simplified graph. And then um, I'll talk about how you then, when you look at that simplified graph, uh, eventually you can make your own determinations on how that changes our projections. And you'll see that I don't even, um, up here tonight, get into projecting out five years. I really want to project out four years, and that's difficult enough, and I'll talk about why that is. but. Uh, again, it, it, whenever we do these projections, Kim and I are always going to be wrong. We're always going to, it's kind of like projecting the weather. Because as these assumptions change, and they're always changing, um, we're never going to be right in our projections to you as a school board. Um, I will say that when I first came here in 2003, there were no five-year projections ever done for Hastings. There wasn't assumptions made there were not budgets that were brought forward. And I think that's one of the things that board members have appreciated over the, the years that at least I, I and Kim uh, give you these assumptions so then that helps, helps to guide you. So some of the things that, that go into the assumptions and is background information for you to, to look at are all the variables that go into the budget. I'm just gonna go through these really, really quickly and you can follow Phil if you want. Um, right now, our average severance per uh, teacher retiree is about 72000 So individuals that are still on that part of the severance, when they retire, um, we write out a check on average for 72000 as part of their severance. Um, the retiree health is about uh, 48000 So most retirees in that year get about $120,000 check to them on who is on the old severance plan. Uh, people are working longer. And I, my projection and, and individuals in the uh, teacher negotiations committee have heard me say this, that the rule of 90 used to be for people to retire when they're 56 or 57. Those days are gone. Even if you are rule of 90, we're finding most people to work even longer. And what that means up there is that uh, 
the average retiree health isn't for eight years. It is for about five years because we're finding most people retiring around 60 to 61 right now. Um, and I think that most of us in the room, with the way Social Security is going and where, the way TRA is going, it's going to be that you're going to be working uh, beyond 61, 65. So that will impact that down the road. Um, the average salary of a new teacher is 43.9. What that means if you go to our salary schedule and, and the starting salary is 40,000, we want to always hire at 40,000. We hire some on step five, we hire some on step six, masters, etc. So that ties into the average salary. Um, and then when we retire, when a person retires and, and we hire new, we usually get about a forty thousand dollar <laughs> savings then between between those two. Those numbers then tie into when you get to the second page of, of the five-year projection. So for example, in your mind, if you think then that we're going to have five people, five teachers retire at the end of this year, you take five times 40,000, and that improves that budget by 200,000. If you would think that we're going to have seven teachers retire this year, you take seven times 40,000, and it improves that budget by 280,000. For the previous 13 years, I had always included those projections myself and that those were part of the assumptions. And, but it was tough for me to, to guess anymore because I usually would look at rule of 90 and that would be a pretty good guesstimate. And so Kim and I changed our philosophy on that. So when you see the budget on the second page, we no longer put in there that there's going to be four or six or seven where we used to. So the more veteran board members, they, they were used to that. You were used to that type of projection. I'm looking around there, I'm not a veteran board members. Um, but they were used to, they knew that when we brought forward the budget, some of those projections were in there. Those are no longer um, in there. So when you come to a board meeting and you start seeing people retiring, then I figure that you're smart enough to figure out, okay, then that's going to help, help the budget that we had, had projected and had set. Some other things for you to be thinking about, lane changes, what do they cost, what our FTEs are, and then you can see the historical data of uh, what the state of Minnesota has given us on the general ed formula. Uh, quite honestly, the, the last five years have been pretty good compared to the, the previous five years of that. So the state of Minnesota has come around on the general ed formula. Down below then you can see that we did Kim and I did this back in October or November, so this is some old data and you'll get the updated. But we have, we have two referendums, the first one now, thank goodness that our community supported us, and now that's no longer $473, that's $773, and that will expire 10 years from now. Our next referendum will come off on November of 2023. And then, uh, thank goodness, legislators also gave school boards across the state of Minnesota the ability to com convert um, some of the funding as an automatic levy, and we as a board have done that. So we automatically don't have to go to the community for that 300. Um, every five years, you have to come and re-vote on that. And every five years, I will be highly, highly recommending that you as a board um, <coughs> vote for that approval. So that's the first, uh, the upper tier. Then if you get into the other things that go into our five-year projections is the general ed formula. And you can see right on the, on the first one, 2% uh, in the year 2019 and 20. Again, a guess by Kim and I because will we get 2% from our state legislatures when this last biennium we had one of the largest surpluses in the history of the state of Minnesota and we had to fight to get 2%. So for all of you who follow the legislator on that, we had 1.4 billion as a surplus. So again, Kim and I have to put in something for you that's probably going to be wrong one way or the other. When you look at our pupil units uh, and you go out to 2018-19, uh, for the first time in the history of me being here as superintendent, we're actually going to have some student growth projected. We're not going to decline in that year. But then you can see that we are projected to uh, probably decline again. And kindergarten enrollment, um, very tough to project when we really don't know who's out in the, in the homes. <coughs> Interest has been staying stable, and that, in fact, it's been increasing a little bit. 
and the special ed state aid and the compensatory have already changed since we did this projection for you back in the fall. Uh, you heard at a previous board meeting where they already changed the proration. So then Kim and I, not only did we change that proration, but then we went in and changed the projection for the following year. Uh, compensatory has already changed and not for the better. Uh, that's gotten worse since we first did this projection for you uh, back in October uh, and November. The literacy, uh, the Title I, et cetera, the third, the third party billing, the last uh, line item up there, uh, you see a huge jump of 397000 in 2016-17. The state auditors changed how they required that we book things. So rather than being able to carry it forward, we had to book it as what we had on hand at that time. So that's a reserve base that we're starting with, and we just project flatlined out because we never know what students are going to be in our district that are going to need the um, third-party billing, which ties into medical assistance and, and medical needs. Uh, the last one in that area, then, is what comes out of our general fund. Um, this is for basically severance, and it's the severance on the, on the old system. We have two tiers of severance. Um, in most of our contracts, one is a 403B match, and then severance is for um, the more, more veteran staff members. So that's what we take out of our general fund um, to provide so that we can pay the severance down the road. The expenditures then, um, uh, again, is a lot of guesswork that it's not like Kim and I are saying, well, this is where we think it's going to end up at. But we have to put something in there to give the five-year projections. And so you can see um, step in 1%, step in 1%, principals 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 
and she did all the legwork. She analyzed 20 to 30 school districts that had gone to self-fund, and she looked at everything that we would need to do. Uh, we tar talked with all the bargaining groups. It was a huge risk that we took because we didn't know if we were going to fall flat on our face when we went self-funded. A huge, huge risk for the district because if we would have had a premature baby during that first year, if we would have had stem cell cancer, if we would have had somebody in a terrible accident, we, we would have put the district at financial risk, but we said, you know, we need to move on. And I'd say through Kim's work and hard work, we got it off to a good success, 8% in the first year when we were self-funded, then 6%, then 4%, 2%, and 0%. And you would look at this graph and you'd say, well, how is this going to impact our budget then? We're at zero percent. That's great news. And it is great news. Anybody who sits on that committee, um, I know I've learned more about health insurance than I've ever wanted to learn in my lifetime. Um, everything that controls it and doesn't control it. Even at zero percent, we're going to find out tomorrow that our, we're not contributing to it, but our costs are going to go 300000 in one year. That's to manage it. That's to take the high-risk insurance in case something happens. Those costs are going to continue to grow, even though we are going to be recommending uh, a zero percent. And whether or not I can say to you that this previous eight years have impacted what we have to pay for health insurance, or whether or not it's the plans that we've chosen compared to what other districts have, it's so tough to analyze why we're paying what we're paying in our plans, etc. But the next graph shows this, when we looked at our comparative schools, this is what we pay for family health compared to those comparative schools. And what I did, there's also single insurance on there, so when, when I met with you as a board, I said, this is still driving our costs and our budget. And I took 150 teachers and 100 on single and 150 on family, and I said, if you were in these districts, this is what the cost would be. And in several cases, we're a million dollars each year more that we're paying on just health insurance. So you look at dental insurance. Yeah, it's true that our costs are going to go up 0%. And that's great. But that still doesn't mean that you as a school board and we as a district don't have a high cost for dental insurance. You compare it to the seven schools again. And you take that times two or three years, the cost that we have for dental and health uh, and again, so it ties back to a person saying that insurance doesn't control our negotiations process and isn't a part of our budget. Um, that just totally blows me away. It, it does drive our budget. It, it does drive what we're doing. So I take all those assumptions and I put them into um, this spreadsheet for you. And the top of the blue says that this year that we're currently in, uh, we're projecting that we're going to be at 12.3 million, which is a nice fund balance to have. We were at 13 million. So we're expected to be down $1 million from where we were. If the levy had passed, we were going to be down to 11 million. The levy passed, and so next year our fund balance is going to go up on purpose, just like we told our community that we needed to do. You know, that was a, a huge discussion for us as a board. How do you go to a community when you've got 12 million in your fund balance and say, we need another million a year to survive our declining enrollment? Well, we do. We need to build it up so that we can continue to make prudent decisions. And I know that you as a school board, um, you've already met with me in a work session and you said, Tim, because of that, we're not gonna make budget cuts this year. We're not going to tell you and the principals to make 300000 or 400000 uh, in cuts. Uh, as people retire, we want you to look at those positions and see if you can downsize. But for this year, we're not going to be making uh, those budget reductions. You can see then that when you take the adjusted pupil units, the general ed formula, the referendum coming in, it ties into our fund balance policy. That was another question that one of you had asked me, um, what is our fund balance policy? The board about five years ago for the first time set a fund balance policy, and it came on the heels of when legislators were withholding the money from us. 
and we were having to borrow money to cash flow to, to pay our bills. So at that time, our auditors five years ago came to the board, most of you uh, were not here, and said that most districts in the state of Minnesota, a district in the state of Minnesota should have two months of a fund balance to pay bills because that money isn't always sitting there. On paper, it says that that's what we have, but it's not coming in from the state of Minnesota all in a timely monthly fashion. It's not coming in from the federal government. So if you don't have that amount in there, then Kim is going to a bank and we're borrowing money to cash flow to pay bills. Five years ago, that amount, that, that two months was $7 million. Right now, in the year 2018, it's up to $8 million. Because as our budget grows, that means that the fund, fund balance um, has to grow. So you'll see that fund balance policy as it travels along the line, even though our savings account in 2019, 2020, the fund balance starts to go down, the fund balance policy is going up. Because just because the, the fund balance goes down doesn't mean our overall budget isn't growing. That's still growing, but our savings account is going down. So our fund balance policy isn't a set dollar amount. It's not just seven million, it's not just 7.5 million. It grows and changes as our overall budget grows and changes. Kim puts this uh, on every five-year projection that we've done since uh, we've been doing this, and that's pupil units. If we're off by 20, one way or the other, you can see how much it you can see how much it impacts our budget and how much we're going to be um, off one way or the other. And then down below, again, and I know, I know that one of you is, as board members that said to me that you would maybe like this type of outline for every situation. I, so you would like to have, as a board member, a line item that we cut one teacher at the high school, what would that, at one teacher at every level, what would that be? If we cut a custodian at every level, what would that be? If uh, our liability insurance goes up 2%, what would it be? If our liability insurance went 3%, what would it be? I prefer not to, to do that because that, this page for me already is long enough that that list of how that would transfer out would go on forever, forever and ever. You could have on their utilities. You could have on their transportation. You could have everything. I like where you as a board member see what the base is, and then as you know that these assumptions change and as we make decisions. So for example, as we've met with the AVID program, and you see where we're gonna be in the year 2020, 2021, you know from our discussion that we're gonna be up in two FTEs if we go with the AVID program, correct? So then you go back to this cheat sheet on the first page and you say, well, by the year 2021, we're gonna be up two teachers of FTE teaching the AVID program, and you look at what those costs are, then you know that our budget's going to decrease by, by that amount. And I, I think too that there's, there's three things that drive budgets for school districts. It's your, your, your basic contracts, your insurances, and your student enrollment. Those are the three, three big things that, that drive it. Um, state of Minnesota, if they would just stay consistent on one and a half to 2%, um, then that would give us a base to make decisions. You know, and I look at, at the declining enrollment, I've never viewed this as a negative to you. When I go around and speak about this, when I talk about this in the community, yeah, if you ask the superintendent, would they rather be in a district where it's slight growth or slight decline? Every superintendent would say they'd love to be in a district where there's slight growth because then it's slight growth in, in revenue. But I've always said on this page, we're still going to be fine a decade from now. We're still going to have 300 students at every grade level at minimum a decade from now. That still is a great school district. And I think too that when you, when you think about this process, when you look at our just our last six year history, the system has worked pretty well. Our revised budget over the last six years, we've been within 
of our guests were 0.03%. The only years that we were off by 1% was in, when they changed the special ed formula and we came to you as a board for, the, for those of you who were wrong and we said to you, the formulas change. But to be off 1% on 94 million and 92 million of revenue and expenditures coming in, the, the process that we've been using um, has been pretty good and I won't want to defer from it very much because it has it has been working. And yet I work for you as a school board. So if you in a work session say to me, that's fine Tim, we like what you presented but we want to add more lines, we'll add more lines. If you want to change something else or change assumptions that you think that we should add to it, that's fine. Um, Kim and I work for you, but so far, um, as we've been going through it, uh, when you're within 1%, it's, it's pretty good. So um, I apologize to board members who, uh, usually every October, November, I go through it, it with, with every board member. Uh, Dave and Kelsey, you're brand new, so I know that this, uh, I didn't get to go through this with you, and Peter, you came on uh, mid-year. So uh, again, in our next work session, we'll take some time to just go through these five-year projections and for you to let me know um, are there some other things that you would like me to change as we continue to move forward. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to our um, action items for today. Our first action item is a motion to approve a resolution for urging the governor and legislature to strenuously advocate for significant increases in federal special education funding and meaningful special education reforms at the state level. This was provided in Exhibit A, the full resolution. I would accept a motion in the second that waives the reading. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Joe Becker. Yes. Peter Bushman. Yes. Scott Gergen? Yes. Lisa Hadeen? Yes. Dave Pemble? Yes. Russ Roloff? Yes. Kelsey Weeds? Yes. Thank you. Our second action item for tonight is a motion to approve a resolution directing the state of Minnesota to call upon the Congress of the United States to pass appropriate legislation in order to increase funding for federal special education mandates to meet the urgent financial special education needs of our cities and towns. That complete resolution is provided in Exhibit B. I would uh, accept a motion in the second. Is there a way to read? Motion. Second. second. Thank you. Russ, would you think we'll call vote? Joe Becker. Yes. Peter Busenbach. Yes. Scott Bergen. Yes. Lisa Dean. Yes. Dave Pemble. Yes. Russ Roloff. Yes. Kelsey Waits. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. Our third action item is a motion to approve the 2017-18 non-public transportation reimbursement rate, $225 per student, for families whose children attend non-public schools outside of District 200. Can I get a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Uh, again, I, I did clarify in an email with you that um, the board could choose to go above or below this rate, the state of Minnesota sends us a set amount of dollars um, for this area. What Kim then does is, is take our students that have used this and our families in the past, and she divides it by that number of students. And that's the amount that we recommend to you as a board so that we don't we don't lose or we don't gain money. Um, we try to give all the money back to those families. So that's how we come. This rate all depends on how many families are using it and then the, the amount, the pot of money that the state gives us. So that's how we base our recommendation to you as a board. Are there any questions? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Our fourth action item tonight is a motion to approve the 2019-2020 school calendar. I get a motion and a second. So moved. Second. second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? I just want to share that um, the calendar committee has been led by uh, Mike Johnson for many years now. There might be several individuals that sit on, on that committee. We appreciate all the, the work that goes into it. Probably about four to five years ago, we tried we tried going to where we approve a calendar even in advance because we do have families contacting us on, 
um, vacation and trying to match up with students from that might be in college, etc. Um, this ties with the parameters of what we have in our, our master agreement as well for personal leave days, staff development days as well. So um, I'm recommending approval as well. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed to the sign? Motion carries. Our fifth action item tonight is a motion to approve the retirement of three individuals. Can I get a motion and a second? So moved. Second. I'm sure Deanna got somebody for that second. <laughs> All right. Is there any discussion? Kathy Warren. Woo <laughs> I assume you're like celebrating Kathy Warren, the individual, yeah, not her chosen retirement. <laughs> all right, this is, I want to clarify. We're celebrating all the. Uh, the fact that you're celebrating the fabulous years of service and the uh, value that she's provided to our community. I would agree. Um, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Our sixth action item tonight is a motion to approve the leave of a list of individuals, 789, somewhere in there. Can I get a motion and a second? Motion. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Seventh action item. We have a motion to accept the resignation of uh, a number of individuals, seven or eight, it looks like. Can I get a motion or a second? Motion. Second. 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 Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Next, we have a motion to approve um, some changes in assignment, primarily amongst our uh, custodial and maintenance staff. Can I get a motion or a second? So moved. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And then our final action item of the night is a motion to approve the employment of uh, a solid list of individuals, both as certified staff and non-certified staff. Can I get a motion and a second? Motion. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Under other business, we have some upcoming dates. Seventh uh, of March for our work session. That will be um, that will be at the middle school. Okay. And it's listed on the agenda as to be determined. The middle school. We'll, we'll probably start out here, but uh, Mark or Joel Haas will join us, and we're going to do a walking tour of the middle school because a lot of the discussion is on um, how are we going to phase in the. The middle school construction are we going to do it over three summers or are we going to have construction on site during the school year 2019-2020 <laughs> and so part of that is that walking uh, tour those who have been on the facility committee um, they know this issue better than the rest of you so uh, if you get here and we're not here come find us we're, we're, we're on tour and then we'll come back and have some pretty serious discussion about that because we need to make that decision um, probably at the March board meeting because then it's time to let the, the public know about that and as we start bidding for that as well because it will be bid differently if we do it three summers. So we'll start out there. We'll also have some avid discuss discussion. We'll probably also have some discussion on the structure of the middle school day at that meeting. I also hope that elementary principals come to talk about the redistricting of the boundary lines. Uh, we've analyzed that and I want board members now to, to see that and again so that we can have public discussion on that issue as well. So that evening will probably be a two and a half to three hour uh, meeting I'm guessing pretty heavy. Sounds good. It's um, you know, I love a heavy meeting, I love a lot of work, but uh, I like that we're starting to dig into the, into the construction piece off of that bond. Yeah, so it's terrific to be moving forward on that. It's, it's challenging. And that reminds me, Russ, uh, Dave, or who's on the facility committee? Peter, Russ, and, and Joel. Um, tentatively mark 4 o'clock uh, this Monday with Wold. Um, and we'll meet right here. Scott didn't confirm it with me yet, but I told him that that would be our preferred time to meet um, on that issue. And that, the main issue on that is the high school roof. Um, 
again, depending upon what we do at the high school, if it's either going to be a three-year project or a two-year project. Um, and but they want decisions because they're going to get it for the summer. They want some of your input. That, too, probably will come to the rest of the, the board on March 7th as well. Okay. We'll just drip out there. It sounds like the March board meeting, the regular March board meeting, might be a little heavy, too. Yes. We start, start moving some of these towards action. But some of those presentations, and yeah. if we're moving forward, we'll be at that meeting. Yeah, exactly. So, and roll up our sleeves. All right. I think that's also when we have to make our recommendation for self-funded health care as well. You're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're absolutely Just right. another thing to yeah, add mix. All right. Um, uh, student high school lunch is on the, the 20th. I'm sure we know who those board members are that are attending. And our next regular board meeting starts at 6 o'clock. It'll be on the 21st of March. And expect it to be um, active. Could I get a motion to close our meeting for a negotiation update? Motion and second, please. So I'll do second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed, same sign. Okay, very easy.